quick as I can because, um, first of all, thank you guys for coming out to listen to me. Um, and as much as I do enjoy listening to myself, I'm actually more interested in hearing from you. So what I'd like to do is kind of get through as much of the material quickly as I can so that we can then open it up to questions. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, listen, I'm, I'm Rob Pye. I'm the, um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Ivy Watson. I'm actually located here in Austin. This is native for me. Um, and I have the privilege of being able to lead IBM's technical strategy in the area of cognitive computing and specifically around augmented intelligence. And so what I want to do today is kind of take you through what Watson is. Um, I'm going to speak to how it works. I know that was part of what we promised in the headline for this session. I'm going to speak to that more than I'm going to um, give you any internal diagrams. I won't give you any of my design diagram, uh, documents, but I will uh, certainly speak to how it works um, to the extent that I can do that in this time frame. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the elements of what Watson is, and I want to start with something very fundamental, which I believe in strongly, and that is that cognitive computing is about amplifying human cognition. Uh, I know there's a lot of you know, discussion out in the world about the role of AI. We don't have to go very far to find movies that describe a world of AI that can, for some of us, be a little bit scary. But I think all of that tends to um, misrepresent the most important value that cognitive computer brings to the table. It's not about replicating the human mind. Uh, there are some aspects of what we do in the cognitive computing space that require that the cognitive system have a pretty acute understanding of who we are, what we mean when we say things, what is meant in the literature that we might read, uh, to be able to reason about um, that. But at the end of the day, you know, we are pretty remarkable in our, in our own right. We have a tremendous cognitive capability uh, as individuals, as human beings. We have the ability to, um, to adapt, to recognize, to, to reason, to interpret, to kind of formulate our own opinions, to drive our own motivations, to be able to um, be informed by our own emotional sense of reality, uh, to use that and judge the best use of what we do know and we are, what we are able to think about, to be creative. These are all uniquely human traits. And um, to a large extent, it's, it, it's not very practical or useful for us to replicate all of that in a cognitive system. What is useful is to recognize that we as human beings have certain limitations. You know, there's only so much that we can read in a day. There's only so much that we can assimilate. There's only so much that we can retain or recall at the moment that we need to make decisions. And those limitations actually constrain us. They constrain our creative processes. They constrain our ability to recognize alternate points of view. They constrain our ability to see the world for what it really is and to make decisions that empower us as opposed to constrain ourselves. And so, you know, what we look for in a cognitive system is to break through that, to allow people to see a different perspective, to see through our own biases, to recognize our biases when they exist, and to be able to understand what is possible to understand that will allow us to make better decisions. And so those are our goals in cognitive computing. When we talk about AI and IBM, we don't really think of it as artificial intelligence the way that that Minsky and Chomsky and other people of the past have often referred to AI as being a recreation of the human mind and tested by its ability to think the same, the same way that we do, to create this can fool us into having the same intelligence that we have. Uh, we think of it as augmented intelligence to mean everything that I just said. So again, you know, these cognitive systems have to be able to understand us. To be able to operate and to be able to sort of extend our own thinking, they have to begin by understanding what we mean when we say things or what we mean when we are motivated by certain things, right? What our goals and aspirations are. They need to be able to understand that well enough to use that as a context for how it reasons about 
the information that it has available to us and apply that to the problems that we're trying to solve. There is a lot of discussion about the use of AI today in the world of chatbots. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this, but when we talk about chatbots, most of our experiences today with chatbots are relatively simple. Most of what we see today in terms of chatbots are systems that command and respond and, and don't really deeply reason. And we really want to be sure that when we think about the old role of cognitive thinking, as we develop and evolve the cognitive technologies, that we're doing so. The reason about problems that we have, so that the information they supply to us in our own problem resolution process is relevant to that problem, relevant to us. That when we see these kinds of answers coming back from the system, they are almost intuitively obvious as having a flexibility to what we're trying to solve. And of course, we can't just simply program these systems. You know, we've got 70 years of modern computing architectures and software development that was informed by the thinking of sort of the godfathers, if you will, of modern computing, people like Jonathan Van Neumann and Alan Turing, that, that at the time that they were creating computers had a fairly myopic view of the world. I mean, what I mean by that is not, to, not by any way means to be uh, disrespectful of what they did, but you know, they were mathematicians, which meant that they solved the world through mathematics and through mathematical models. They had a mental model that said that if they can create a mathematical model to represent a problem, then they could execute that mathematical model to understand it and to come up with answers about that problem, which is great for a whole variety of problems that we face. You know, whether we're trying to predict climate change or we're trying to predict the, you know, how neutrons are going to collide to create energy, or if we're trying to understand, you know, basic chemistry and physics and things like that, you know, even economics, these sort of lend themselves well to being modeled primarily because the precision that they need is inherent in the problem. Um, but that's not typical of our human experience. You know, the way that we get exposed to the world and how we reason about the world that we're exposed to is subject to so many variables that it's hard to even define what a model would look like that properly represents those experiences and acts on those experiences and causes us to think differently about those experiences. So rather than focusing on mathematical models, we have to look at other techniques for representing the real world as we experience it and assimilating from that real world experience the things that are meaningful and useful to us. You will hear us often talk about in the world of AI the use of machine learning or deep learning algorithms. What these are doing essentially is picking up signals, sometimes signals that have no direct semantic value to us. We can't interpret why when two words are put together separated by two other words that they have more meaning than when they're separated by three words or five words. The linguistic properties of our language oftentimes are obscured in a set of signals that are sort of too subtle for us to apply any real semantic meaning to, but yet they are things that inform us in the way that we interpret what we're exposed to. And that's what machine learning and deep learning is doing for us, is it's allowing us to pick up those little signals that by themselves have no meaning, but when they're taken together at different degrees of amplitude, 